Well, now let's look at the gift of teaching. And Luke, in Luke chapter 1, is a beautiful picture of a person who is not only skilled as a doctor, but also gifted as a teacher. And so if you want to read with me in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, we read about him. And we see this gift of teaching right from the beginning of his gospel. For Luke writes in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. And just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, a reference to Jesus. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Here we see a great description of what Bible study looks like and what good Bible teaching should have within it. And so if you'll notice with me, Luke says that there's many that have done different accounts, but I myself have carefully investigated everything. What was he doing? He was observing the facts of Jesus and what he did and who he is. And in Bible study, that's called observation. We observe what's in the text. We observe what we learn about God. That's part of the gift of teaching that's so necessary as a first stage. We have to observe what God's Word says. And then we can move on to the second thing that Luke says he did as well, and that is that he wrote up an orderly account. And this is a picture of interpretation. He put an orderly account together. He interpreted things so that they could be better understood. And this is the second stage of Bible study, and this is the second stage that we have to do when a person teaches. They have to anticipate what the questions might be and give an orderly account so that people can be more clear on what the truth is. That's what that gift of teaching does. One person I know who's a great preacher, what he does is he actually anticipates the questions and the problems of the people that will hear him, and then he speaks directly to those in an orderly way, helping to clarify the truth that he has discerned even ahead of time needs to be spoken to in the Bible teaching that he does. And then finally, Luke says here, so that you may know the certainty of what you've been taught. And this is that final step in good Bible study, first observation, then interpretation, and then application, so that you may know with certainty these things. And that's what that gift of teaching is motivated to do. It's motivated to study God's Word, to observe it carefully, and then to orderly arrange it so that people can understand it and apply it to their lives. And there's certain, we're all to be studying the Bible. We're all to maybe be teaching somewhere a little bit in this kind of way. But as we do, we begin to discover that perhaps God has given us a gift of teaching. And then there's the gift of encouragement. Barnabas is the one who's called the son of encouragement. When we want to look at encouragement, we look at Barnabas. We see how he was willing to come alongside the Apostle Paul and encourage him. We see how he was willing to go all the way to Tarsus to get the Apostle Paul and bring him back to Antioch and work side by side and encourage one another, encourage God's people in the church. We see him encouraging even John Mark by saying, hey, 
You can't go on our trip in Acts 15, but you can come with me. We'll go on a trip. Always encouraging. And so it is that there are people among us that they move among us and they just have an eye to what they can do to lift our spirit, to comfort us when we're hurting, to challenge us perhaps with something we need to think about, to help to build a relationship, to help us reflect on what God is doing, to help us refocus our lives, to help us see where resources might be and to always be reviewing what God is doing and what's next that gift of encouragement. And then in Matthew, we have clearly the gift of giving. There is no one gospel writer who spoke more about money than Matthew. He is the one who spoke the most about money. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, so when you give to the needy, he talks about how to do that, not publicly and for show, but privately and in secret. He says in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21, Do not store up treasures for yourself on earth, where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in. Store up treasures in heaven. And then, of course, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, You cannot serve God and mammon or money. You can't do it. You'll have one or other as the master. And so, Matthew talks a lot about the use of money. And we also see him use it wisely when Jesus called him in Luke chapter 5 to be one of his apostles. Remember what he did? He used his money to throw a really big pizza party. And he wanted all his friends to be introduced to Jesus. And that's one of the things that people with the gift of giving do is they're very generous with their resources so that others can find Christ, whether it's through throwing a party or funding a mission or giving generously to a church, because there's that gift of giving. And we're all to give. But over time, some have a special gift to give. And with them comes not only this generosity, but they're also often very discerning in how to develop money resources for God's kingdom and they're also very discreet in the way they give. They're oftentimes the one that you would never would guess is the one who's the most generous giver in the whole church. Because it's not always those that are the most wealthy. Because we all remember the widow's might of the widow who put all she had into the temple treasury. So it's not how much, but it's this drive, this desire to to develop resources and to give them for the sake of God's kingdom. That should be true for every one of us, but there is a special gift of giving. And then the gift of leadership. We see this obviously in Peter. His name is changed to the rock. When I think about a rock, I think about the person in the room who is stable, that other people lean on, who sustains a direction over time, who has a clear vision. And Peter obviously is that rock. He's that one with that gift of leadership. It's interesting, the Greek word here, to lead, actually means to stand before people. There are some people who are, they don't want to get in front of a crowd. They don't want to get in front of people. It makes them very nervous. But other people are gifted to stand before, to lead a meeting to um, give again that solid direction to a ministry. You remember Jesus gave a clear call to Peter, and then when he blew it, when he denied the Lord three times, three times Jesus said to him on that beach as he made fish for them on the shore, Peter, do you love me? Three times Peter had denied the Lord, but three times Jesus restored him and charged him to feed my sheep and take care of my lambs. That gift of leadership has that view and that heart and that passion. And it might begin because we lead a Sunday school class. It might begin because God's gifted us to lead a small group and we begin to see more and more that God uses us to lead His people, 
to serve his people, not to dictate or to dominate. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. But to lead. And then, of course, John has to be the one with the gift of mercy. Because we see in the Gospels that John is the merciful one. This gift of mercy is the desire to help those who are hurting. Person with the gift of compassion. And I think it's obvious that this is where John's gift was, the one who wrote the Gospel of John, the one who wrote the first, second, and third epistles of John. I think it's obvious that he has this gift of mercy because of all the Gospel writers, he's the only one who gives a sensitive story of how Jesus met that woman at the well in Samaria in John 4. G John is the only one who talks with great sensitivity how Jesus handled the woman caught in adultery. John is the only one who gives us that scene at the foot of the cross where Jesus says to John, Behold your mother, and to his mother, Behold your son. You don't entrust your mother to somebody who's just going to drive her into the dust. You entrust, you entrust your mother to somebody who has a gift of mercy. And so merciful people with the gift of mercy are sensitive to others. John in his epistles continually says, My dear children, my dear friends. There's a drive to show compassion. John is the one who in 1 John again and again says, If we don't show compassion, acts of love toward people, then our faith is dead and we're loving only with word and tongue. And so this gift of mercy is a beautiful thing as well. Now in Romans 12 verse 3, we read that we are each given the measure of faith. We are each given a gift, all responsibilities, but we're not given all these as gifts. We're given a gift. A measure, pouring out one measure to us. But isn't it interesting in John chapter 3, John says of Jesus that Jesus had the Spirit without measure. And so he is the one who is prophet. He is the one who is servant. He is the one who is teacher. He is the one who is encourager. He is the one who is giver. He is the one who is leader. He is the one who is merciful. And one great project to do is to go through with whatever your gift might be and see how Jesus manifested that gift because he had the Spirit without measure, having all of these as indeed God with us, he who is true God and true man.